afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar. My name is Yin from Rexel, and I will be hosting the session today. Uh, we're just going to allow a little bit more time for the rest of the attendees to log in, so we'll be starting shortly. Thank you for your patience, and we'll get going in a few moments. Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, learn about EV charging and how to make the most out of this growing market with Schneider Electric. My name is Yin, I'm the Marketing Executive at Rexel. Today I'm joined by Jan Dale, E-Mobility Business Development Manager. Uh, please note that this is a recorded webinar and it will be available to watch on demand on the Rexel website. This webinar is also CPD accredited and the certificates will be sent directly to the email address you registered with for the webinar and it can take up to four to five weeks to arrive. If you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A bubble, which you can select from the menu on the side and we will answer them at the very end. Now passing the time over to Jan. Thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody to uh, this CPD in our e-mobility learning series, focusing today specifically on EV charging. Uh, like Ian said, any questions at all, pop them in the chat and uh, we'll be happy to answer them at the end. Brief introduction, my name is Jan Dale. I am a BDM here at Schneider in the e-mobility team. I've been in EV for about four years now, uh, working across different companies, different solutions. Uh, so hopefully I'll be pretty well placed to answer any questions that you might have. If you're quick, you can scan that QR code, find me on LinkedIn if you'd like to find me any questions on there directly. Um, so uh, about this CPD course today, um, essentially we're trying to help you learn about different types of EVs and how they actually work, focusing specifically on the chargers themselves and how they work in tandem with energy management, power distributions and the buildings where they are charged as a connected solution. Uh, we'll also go through some UK specific regulations. In terms of the agenda today, we're going to look at what's inside an EV, different charging modes and socket types, what's actually inside the charger itself, the different applications for uh, different types of EV chargers, how we actually manage the energy flow to the chargers, connected solutions. Like I said, we'll touch on uh, regulations and then we'll have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. So we'll jump right into it. What is EV charging? Start at the basics. What's inside an electric vehicle? It's very different to your internal combustion engine vehicle, far fewer moving parts. In an EV, you've got an electric motor, a battery, an onboard charger, and your charging inlets for both AC and DC. Mechanically, that is about it. Um, today, we're gonna be focusing mainly on battery electric vehicles. Uh, the difference you'll hear, BEV, VEV, uh, Battery EVs are solely powered by a rechargeable uh, battery as opposed to a plug-in hybrid where there, there might also be a, an internal combustion engine uh, running in tandem. So examples of BEVs you can see here, Model 3, Mini Electric. You'll see them all over on the road now. Uh, they're becoming quite the norm. So 
EV charging is broken down into AC charging and DC charging. AC obviously alternating current, DC direct current. This is because the vehicle's battery is charged by direct current but the current from the grid is alternating current. So AC charging is entirely dependent on the vehicle's onboard converter. Direct current charging is entirely dependent on the max speed that the battery can actually take, uh, but it bypasses that onboard converter, uh, which is why you'll see much faster charging times. So when it comes to different modes. You'll, you'll often see these on specifications. You might be looking at mode three or mode four charging. Mode one is old school. It's a standard socket outlet, uh, domestic install. It, it's used to charge your vehicle very slowly, you know, through a three pin plug, through a, a, a single phase connection that you connect to the car. We wouldn't ever recommend relying on this this mode of charging it takes a really long time and it presents safety issues as well uh, quite often you'll see breakers trip because recharging uh, uses the same switchboard that all your other outgoing power sockets in in a house might use if it's in a domestic setting uh, there's risk of fire or electric shock if there's non-compliance of the electrical installation or if you you found a, a cheap charger online uh, that doesn't meet regulation um, because of these risks this mode's actually banned in, in a few countries, uh, the states being most prominent. Mode two is your standard socket outlet, but with actual EV supply equipment. It's the same as mode one, but it's got a control pilot function and a system for personal protection against electric shocks. So it's still going to be just as slow, but at least you've got a little bit of embedded protection. Mode 3 and Mode 4 charging is what you're most likely to see on your specifications, uh, on any new projects that, that you're working on. So Mode 3 is AC EV equipment that's permanently connected to an AC supply network. Uh, mode 3 involves the use of a dedicated EV charger that's connected to, to a dedicated supply. Power range is faster, so you can go from 3.7 kilowatts up to 22 kilowatts AC. That enables those higher end vehicles to actually charge quite quickly, kind of 30 to 40 miles of range per hour of charging. As I mentioned earlier, this is fully dependent on the on the car um, based on its onboard converter. Lots will have seven kilowatt converters, some 11 kilowatts and very few 22 kilowatt converters. Uh, but empty to full, you're lo usually looking at seven to 12 hours when you're AC charging. Then we look at mode four, which is DC uh, supply equipment. In mode four, charging is done through DC EV chargers that are connected either directly to an AC or even a DC supply network. Uh, EV chargers deliver DC current directly to the battery. They bypass the onboard uh, converter and charging can therefore be done a lot faster. You've got a dedicated tether, tether cable as well, so you don't need to worry about uh, the customer lugging cables around if necessary. Here you're looking at going from 20 to 80% state of charge in, in as little as half an hour, 45 minutes. So in terms of socket types, mode one, like I said, you're looking at a standard three pin connector. Mode two, you've you're looking at uh, a, a slightly converted cable with that built-in connect, uh, built-in protection, where you might have a Type One or a Type Two socket. So Type One is a legacy AC socket. It's something that was used quite widely across Japan and in early EV models. Type Two is becoming the norm and, and is actually standardised across Europe now for all new chargers. Moving on to Mode Three, then again most new chargers that are going on the market in the AC world are type 2 socketed. So even if the vehicle has a type 1 socket, you can buy a type 2 to type 1 uh, connector. So yeah, you won't see type 1 out there very much these days. It's old uh, Nissan Leafs, Renault Zoes, those sorts of vehicles. But, but moving forward, everything will be going to this Type 2 range, which is where we get on to DC charging. So DC, we've got CHAdeMO and CCS. Uh, so, oops, pardon me, skip forward a slide. CHAdeMO, again, is a legacy 
uh, socket solution. It's a Japanese standard that is being phased out across across the world now. CCS is actually the EU standard, um, so you will only see CCS connectors on the vehicles moving forward. So DC chargers can be specified because of the tether cable with a CHAdeMO or a CCS um, plug. It's entirely down to the end user, but typically moving forward, it, it will be CCS connectors that are used. So EV charging power obviously is broken down into single phase and three phase. On the AC front, single phase covers 3.7 kilowatts to 7.4 kilowatts. Three phase covers 11 kilowatts to 22 kilowatts. DC charging is three phase only. Uh, anything above 24 kilowatts goes into that DC realm. It says here 24 to 50 kilowatts. Uh, you'll see charges all the way up to 350 kilowatts uh, these days. Um, that they're, they're getting faster and faster uh, as time goes on. So this slide shows what's inside a typical AC charger. Uh, this is our EV Pro Link AC unit. Uh, our Pro AC chargers are targeted for commercial or public use, so they're a little bit bigger than your typical domestic charger. Domestic chargers can be a little bit smaller because they are just a socket on the wall. Whereas these units, we build in different parts like the MID meter, built-in RCD protection, as opposed to having these parts further upstream. Um, like I said, we've got a built-in RCD. This is for extra protection, minimizing fault currents. We've also got a dedicated RFID and NFC board, which allows users to activate charges with RFID cards if they've already got security passes, things like that. We can actually loop that authentication in to the EV charging, or some charge point operators will provide different RFID cards for their users. In terms of the DC side, we've got a, a, a quite a broad product range here. The lowest DC unit we've got is the 60 kilowatt unit that you can see here, actually made available this month to the UK market. So when when we look at this unit, it's got built-in power modules, so two 30 kilowatt power modules that are able to charge two vehicles simultaneously at 30 kilowatts each, or if one vehicle is plugged in, a maximum charge rate of 60 kilowatts. Uh, I won't talk you through every single point on this slide, but some of the key features to point out are the advanced connectivity. So you've got, again, your built-in RFID or NFC reader, or we can also implement a payment terminal if required. Uh, we've got a seven inch touchscreen that makes it nice and easy for end users to see what they're actually doing. Uh, following on from the 60 kilowatt unit, we've got our EV Link Pro DC 180 kilowatt charger. Again, this uses the same 30 kilowatt power modules, but obviously has uh, a lot more of them. This unit can actually be broken down to a 120 kilowatt unit, 150 kilowatt unit, and 180 kilowatt unit. So you can order 120 kilowatt unit and have that flexibility to add additional modules should the need arise for faster EV charging. Again, a lot of the the, the same benefits to the project product. We've got uh, anti-tripping devices built in and um, the same RFID and NFC readers. All of our units are OCPP compliant. Uh, it's, it's a phrase that you might hear uh, thrown around the industry. OCPP stands for Open Charge Point Protocol, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but yeah, all of these units can be used with existing software solutions that customers might have in place. Just touching on the references here for the units. So where do you charge and what type of charger do you actually use? Uh, unlike your typical ICE vehicle, which refuel at petrol stations, EVs are charged kind of anywhere you park, at home, at work, or at destinations if you're going out for the day, for example. The charging time, the cost, and the charging mode, a number of charges all depends on the charging station. 
when it comes to residential charging, obviously home is the most common place to charge. It's where your vehicle spends the majority of its dwell time. It's cost effective and is normally sufficient for your daily run around to on the school run or to go to the shops. It's a lot more convenient than just refueling your vehicles at a petrol station because you wake up every day and your, your car is fully charged. When it comes to workplace EV charging stations, they're becoming really commonplace now. You'll you'll go to, to different offices and they'll usually have a bank of chargers and it really helps with that decarbonisation strategy. And it's really attractive for employees, especially if the price of charging is equivalent or lower than the price of charging at home. So workplace charging can obviously be an opportunity to encourage EV adoption for employees that don't have charge points at home or for employees who do that longer commute. It just makes life a little bit easier um, and just makes that enablement piece uh, whole for EV charging. And then you come to the commercial building, EV charging stations. So other destinations like supermarkets, shopping malls, restaurants, public car parks can be equipped with EV charging points. Again, you'll start to see them cropping up now. And this can provide a great end user experience for the person visiting the site, but it can also be a, a way for these sites to drive revenue. Depending on what you set your pence per kilowatt hour tariff as, you can look to make a small return on your investment. Then finally, we come to the fast in-transit EV charging stations, the DC chargers. That's where you want to charge as quickly as possible because you're on the move or, or doing a long journey. Normally, you'll see these located on motorway service stations or indeed in city hubs. Um, power range, like I mentioned, goes from 50 kilowatts up. So your charging time is normally half an hour to an hour. Um, even though it's convenient, it is normally more expensive for the end user. So DC charging, it's finding that sweet spot between providing a service for an end user versus if you're running a last mile delivery company and you're running EVs, you need those charges in place because you've got vehicles coming in and out all day long. So that's the hardware side of things. Normally what people think about is EV chargers, user experience, but actually that is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we provide a full energy management solution and you can see here that actually when it comes to costs of EV charging, hardware and UX only accounts for about 47%. 53% of the cost tends to come from upgrade costs, software and service packages. And um, yeah, EV charging is a high power load infrastructure. If you've got a building that has 100 amp three phase supply, a single 22 kilowatt charger will require 32 amps across all three phases of that supply. So this is where energy management comes into play and it's essentially a must. It helps buildings that have energy uh, limitations uh, and, and contributing to, to their grid balance. And with EVs becoming more popular, the availability of EV charging is essential for EV drivers. So you have to make use of what you have, but also have the ability to install more chargers as and when the need arrives. So this is the problem. Without energy management, you risk peaking above your max power or above your maximum subscribed power. To counteract that, you might increase your max subscribed power, but that's going to cost money. You know, you risk your supply being cut off. If you peak above your max power, you, you have uh, you, you triple your switches. If you go above your subscribed power, you can get penalties, uh, heavy fines are, are enforced, and uh, obviously increasing your your subscribed power can be expensive. So when it comes to energy management, we've got a couple, couple of different solutions. On the left here, you can see our static load management. It limits the power drawn by the EV charging loads to a fixed power level. We also have our dynamic load management, as you can see on the right, which optimizes energy use at building level and actually allocates available power to the EV, uh, available building power to the EV charging points. This is 
AI based load management. It optimizes your energy use and costs based on EV planning, energy tariffs, local production, and energy consumption forecasts. This is a, a typical look at a static uh, energy management system. So, in static mode, the load management system regulates and distributes energy evenly and in real time between all of the chargers connected. It will not exceed the static set point for the EV chargers. Um, what this means is uh, that um, the power is evenly distributed to the chargers that you have made available to the chargers without tripping the power supply. Dynamic uh, energy management is a little bit different. The load management system actually allocates the available on site energy in real time to the EV charging network. In doing so, it also temporarily limits charging power to meet the energy constraints imposed by the rest of the electrical installation. So essentially, it looks at the overall power on site and determines how much power can be fed to the EV chargers based on your maximum set point for the entire building. Um, this is a really neat solution because it means when you have those dips in usage, the chargers will get maximum power available. And when you're at your peaks, there's still a trickle charge going to, to the units, which um, yeah will leave end users happy to come out at the end of the day, typically to a full charge. In terms of the connected solutions I mentioned earlier, uh, OCPP, it, it's a great kind of buzzword that people like to throw out in, into specifications. OCPP, like I said, is Open Charge Point Protocol. And what it allows is for hardware to be connected to software. It works really well. If some of your customers have a legacy system in place, they want to swap out the chargers, but actually really like the back office system, they can do that. They can swap out the chargers, install new ones, and then take those new chargers onto their back office that they're used to. Um, and vice versa, obviously. If you've got hardware that you really like, but you're not convinced on the back office that you've currently got in place, you can chop and change as necessary. So obviously Schneider have got the, the full end-to-end -end solution. And as part of that, we do also have a back office. Uh, we call it EcoStructure EV Advisor. And it's a tool developed for everybody, CPOs, install owners, and the EV drivers. So essentially this is a white labeled piece of software that a cpo can come to us or a, an entity that want to become a cpo can come to us and say we want a charge point operating a charge point management system can you help us and what we'll do is we'll create an app create the back office system that allows that new cpo to monitor and manage all charges across their system Again, this is OCPP compliant, so it doesn't matter about the manufacturer. Every charge point on the system can be viewed, uh, monitored, and uh, yeah, it's a really neat solution for anybody wanting to come into the CPO space. As well as this, we, we can help um, white label an app where the end user themselves can actually um, download an app off the Play Store, uh, from X CPO and use the charges that are out there, be they on the public network or on a dedicated um, commercial network. So for, for workplace users, for fleet users. Just a touch here on, on some of the more advanced features for those charge point operators. It gives you a remote super supervision over all the charges, energy optimization so you can see what's being used. It allows remote control and maintenance, access to platform. It allows you to do all of your billing. So custom pricing is all set up within this system. And uh, yeah, I won't run through all those points there. I'll let you read through those. But uh, yeah, it's a really great option if, if you want to get into the CPO space. Just touching on regulations quickly because there have been a lot of changes across the EV market um, and new regulations coming into play very quickly, seemingly overnight. I'll focus on the UK for now. If anybody has any questions on Ireland, we'll, we can answer those questions separately. Um, but there are, were two big 
points that came into play uh, for UK EV charging. First one was the smart charge point regulations in 2021. This passed in July and was enforced in December of 2022. So these regulations are only applicable for private charge points with a power of less than 50 kilowatts. They can be split into nine points, uh, which can be summarized as smart functionality. So with the charging required, has to have the ability to send and receive data via communications. Electricity supply interoperability. So chargers need to be supplier agnostic and be able to communicate even with the change of supplier. Loss of communication network access. So where charging is still available, even if the network is not operating. Safety with the charges required to be equipped with provisions to prevent users from performing tasks that would endanger themselves or others. A measuring system, so that's where electricity imported or exported has to be measured by the charger with duration of charging also required. Uh, off-peak charging, obviously this is to encourage charging off-peak, uh, charging during off-peak hours, uh, just to balance the power demand on the grid. The chargers have to be set up to have default charging hours outside of peak hours, but also provide the users with the opportunity and ability to change or remove these hours, um, both when the unit is first installed or if they change their mind later down the line. Uh, demand side response. So that's where the owner can enter into an agreement for the charger to provide demand side response services, which are controlled by a third party to provide flexibility to network operators offered with a variable tariff and randomized delays, which protect the grid from charges all starting charging simultaneously. You know, everybody gets in from work at 6 p.m. Everybody plugs in when the UK car park is all electric that would put a severe overload on the grid. Uh, so the randomized delays will just uh, prevent that from happening. And finally, security. So all uh, charges going on, on domestic networks need to meet cybersecurity requirements. Um, so yeah, those are the smart charge point regulations that came into play in 2021. The more recent charge point regulations came into play last year and will come into force in November of this year. So with all of these regulations, officially they came to force in November 23, but CPOs are given a grace period essentially to actually um, line all their eggs up and, and get this all sorted. So this is where a lot of difficulties being placed on the public charging uh, realm. Contactless payment readers being a necessity for anything that's above eight kilowatts out there on the public network is a bit of a pain point for a lot of CPOs. Uh, there are different solutions out there. We've got solutions for our 22 kilowatt AC units as well as our DC chargers with integrated payment terminals. This next point, 99% rapid charge network reliability essentially means that any individual charger can only be offline for four days of the year. Um, as a result of that, obviously, providers, CPOs need to have 24-7 EV drive support helpline to be able to recognize faults and, and get them sorted as quickly as possible. All public charge points will have to have open data to ensure that anybody who needs a charger can actually access them. A roaming by charge card as an additional option on all public chargers and standardized pricing metric of pence per kilowatt hour. So this is an interesting one for any end users who want to charge by just the hour on a time basis. That's no longer allowed essentially. Pricing has to be standardized as pence per kilowatt hour, um, which puts a real emphasis on fair pricing across the public network. But all of these points are, are really key for any CPO and anybody looking to become a future CPO. So I know I've rattled through all those slides quite quickly, um, but that's me done. Does anybody have any questions? I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, Yin, I don't know if you've got access to any questions in the chat. Yeah, um, thanks, Yan. As a reminder, if you've got any questions, then feel free to uh, pop them into the Q&A. Um, 
we can unpack some of them now. Um, also, if you do think of any questions after the webinar, then do feel free to email them and I'll forward them on to Jan. So I think first question, um, I think you had mentioned about OCPP, but can you just um, go through again, what is OCPP and why does it matter? Yeah, yeah. so like I mentioned, OCPP is Open Charge Point Protocol, and uh, what it does is allows the end user a degree of flexibility as to what provider they go with. There are some networks out there that aren't OCPP compliant who are finding themselves kind of trapped into one provider and not being able to go anywhere else because they've invested X amount of money into a solution, decided it's not for them, but actually don't have the ability to go elsewhere. So with OCPP compliant hardware and software, it, it gives the end user that ability to turn on the spot if they need to, if they're not enjoying the hardware, if they're not enjoying the software, they can, um, uh, yeah, ad adapt as necessary and bring in other solutions as necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, just another one, who controls the pricing? Yep, that's a really good question. So pricing, it, it depends. On a lot of public networks, you'll find uh, fully funded solutions where a charge point operator has come in, installed charges for public use, uh, but actually paid for the whole installation. So in that scenario, the CPO controls the, the tariff, controls all of the pricing. With a commercial solution that is actually owned by the end user, uh, be it a local council or even for workplace charging, uh, the, the end user dictates the pricing there. So it might be, you know, you, you're an office block owner or, or a landlord and you've put charges in for all of your tenants to use. You can then control the pricing in that scenario based on your incoming pence per kilowatt hour tariff and and the return on on the investment that you'd like to make so yeah any it, it's essentially the owner of the infrastructure if the cpo themselves has directly funded the installation of the chargers they will have the ultimate control whereas if it's if it's owned by an end user a building owner a, a workplace they can decide on the tariff pricing great great thank you and just lastly are there any government grants available yeah, so government grants is uh, a great, great question. There are grants available for commercial EV charging installations. Um, it goes through OZEV, the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. You've got to be an OZEV approved installer installing OZEV approved uh, hardware. Uh, it, there's the Workplace Charging Scheme grant that's worth £350 per socket. Um, it's, a, it's a great incentive if you want to just put a few charges in for um, your, your staff and, and a few visitors to use. There's the infrastructure grant, which is in place for uh, SMEs, I'll say loosely, any anybody who uh, has business with fewer than 259 employees, you can claim a £500 per socket grant for any active bays on top of the 350 pound workplace charging scheme so 850 pounds for active bays active being um, ev bays with a charge point installed and three i think it's just 500 pounds for passive bays so passive bays are where you put in all of the infrastructure ready for a charger to go in but don't actually complete the installation um, there's also the, the the same grant in place there for landlords so if you own a building you'll get that same 500 plus 350 for active bays 500 for passive bays uh, it, it's a great uh, incentive to put in that passive infrastructure for any future installations to really future proof what you're putting in now uh, and, and get a little bit of assistance with that from the government. Um, and then there's currently the schools grant. I'm, I can't remember the total value of that one off the top of my head so I'll have to come back and clarify that um, to whomever asked that question. Um, but yeah, there's a schools grant in place running through until March of next year, which is essentially enabling schools to to install charges for staff and then visitors to site alike. Brilliant. Um, thank you. I've just got another one coming. Try 
trying to ah, there we go so um does the ev link pro dc require a dc feed or an ac so it depends. We can just take a, an AC feed directly from from the grid. If we're bringing in a new supply, uh, we actually provide the the full um, from an MDS substation through to the feeder pillows, through to the charger. Um, so we we can do that, or you can provide a DC feed directly. It, it's dependent on, on whatever works best for the solution. If we're running off of power that's already on site, that'll obviously be AC, um, and then it'll go through the, the uh, rectifier units built into the DC charger, the 30 kilowatt um, modules that I mentioned. Great, thank you. I have a couple more. Um, do carry on, I think we have got some time, so if you think of any more questions, do carry on submitting them through the um, the chat box. Um, just going back to the grants, we've got a question about um, are there any grants for charities? So charities can make use of the workplace charging scheme grant. Um, I'm not sure if there are any others in place currently. I've worked with charities in the past who've made use, I believe, of the infrastructure grant as well, because if you know they're, they're a smaller charity. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there aren't any charity specific grants. Um, but that could that could all change pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, these grants tend to come in uh, seemingly overnight with, without anybody really being yeah. told beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can you explain the need for open device on installations, what they are needed for if they're built in or separate? Are they needed? That's a really good question and one that I wouldn't have the answer to right now. That's uh, It goes a bit too technical for, for my level, but I can come back to that one. Um, sure. If whomever's asked that question, I can take that to our technical team to, to bob that answer out for you. Yeah, most definitely. We can um, get back to any of these questions via email uh, and follow up that way. So any that we're not able to get through, we will um, follow up and, and share the, uh, the answer. Uh, another one is, does the EVCP circuit need to have RCD protection if the EVCP has built in RCD DD? No, so that that's the point of the the built-in RCD prote protection. So our seven kilowatt chargers have it built into the unit. Our twenty-two kilowatt chargers, you'll either need to install it further upstream, uh, or essentially with the space allowed in the chargers, the twenty-two kilowatt unit can either have built-in RCD or the mid meter, which is necessary when it comes to uh, monitoring the monitoring the current for billing purposes. Um, so, yeah, if the unit has built-in RCD protection, you, you won't need it further upstream, but if it's a 22 kilowatt unit with a uh, mid-meter, for example, the RCD protection will then need to go either further upstream or we can supply uh, housing essentially for the chargers themselves where that RCD protection can go in uh, close to the unit. Okay, thank you. Uh, just going back to the grants, with regards to the school grant, do you need to be an approved OZEV installer to access this? Yes, yes you do. Um, yeah, for all of the grants you need to be approved with OZEV as an installer and be installing OZEV approved equipment. So um, it, essentially the way it works is the, the installer themselves obviously go to OZEV. The school will apply for a voucher code, they'll, they'll then take that code directly to OZEV, the installer that is, to recoup the, uh, the money offered to them in that grant. And are there any future grants on the horizon for domestic properties? That you're That's a good question. Um, obviously, there there have been in the past, and they were cut off in March of was it last year or the year before? I can't remember now. It's impossible to say. Obviously, uh, with with a new government in place, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, but but unfortunately, it's really difficult for people within the industry to make a guess one way or the other. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I think 
there's one more question. Uh, does the grant for landlords cover private rented sector and not HMOs? So I'm not sure where it stands on HMOs, but private rented sector, if you've got, you know, a big apartment block, then yep, that 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 will cover you. Um, but in terms of individual residences uh, or, or HMOs, I don't think it covers, but I would have to sense check that one and uh, just clarify that 100%. Great, thank you. Um, we have one, it's more about whether there's any further Schneider training courses available. There are, um, with Rexel anyway, there's some more coming up this year. So if you keep an eye out, for uh, on the emails um, we'll be sending those out uh, shortly I think if I'm not mistaken I think that's all the questions if you do have any more that come through then uh, you can feel free to send them over to marketing at rexel.co.uk and then I'll forward them to Jan um, to answer them and we'll get back to you that way so I uh, think if that's about it, thank you very much, Jan, for um, uh, no your expertise and uh, for this uh, training session. Um, just a reminder that uh, the CPD certificates will be sent directly from CPD, which will take up to four to five weeks and they'll land directly in your inbox. Again, if you've got any queries or questions, then feel free to send them over to marketing at rexel.co.uk. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today and we look forward to having you in our future webinars. Thank you.